Hello everyone and welcome to Sphere's official Pi Day Hackathon. My name is Chris Lassard, your host for the day, joined here by Adam and Ryan. Enjoying those mugs right there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> What's up guys? How's so, it going? So today we're going to be doing a lot of really cool things involving Sphero's newest product, the Rover, which you can find on a Kickstarter. So Adam, can you tell us a little bit more about what the Rover is and what we're about to see today? Well, I actually have one right back here, Chris. Uh, Rover, you know, as everybody kind of knows by now, is our newest platform. Uh, you know, we've been making robot balls for years. Um, Rover was just this idea that we had here at Sphero to kind of like expand our robot platform, mm. make the ultimate base for people to kind of expand and make their mission. So a lot of times when you're building a robot, this is the harder part and the stuff you get stuck on. We figure we'll give you that and then you can build like whatever you want. So it's our newest robot. So we're here at a hackathon. And so for those of us who don't know what a hackathon is, can you go about telling us what that is? Yeah, so I mean, Sphere was actually kind of born out of this idea of hackathons. But the idea is, is that um, all products have sort of this inherent ability to be taken apart and they run on software and hardware. And a lot of times messing around with those two elements in a way that maybe the original manufacturer didn't intend is usually what we call hacking on a product. A hackathon is just people getting together and really just taking a product apart, coming up with ideas and trying to push the limits of that product. So it's all about collaboration. That's awesome. I think sometimes when it comes to technology, people kind of consider it a solitary experience, but this is really showing that it can be collaborative as well. But there's a place that we can go see Rover right now, and that's Kickstarter. And so Ryan, can you walk us through kind of about what our stretch goals are for today? And it is Pi Day, so there's yeah. going to be some theming going around as well. Yes. Happy Pi Day, everybody. So yeah, we, we've got a Kickstarter that's ongoing right now. And we actually have a special level that's going on just today. It's 314 bucks. There's 314 slots available. Um, and it's like a rover package with a free mini and all sorts of really cool stuff. You can check out our Kickstarter um, today and back that. And then we also have a stretch goal that's specific today. Um, if we raise 31,000 and some odd dollars, <laughs> um, we'll be giving away a, a free pair of purple treads. So lots of cool stuff that's happening just today. And, um, and then as uh, Chris was saying earlier with the hackathon, we decided to bring eight lucky backers of the Kickstarter out here to Sphero to be able to play with Rover. Yeah, so you guys flew them out here with some nice kind of like Willy Wonka style invites and uh, now they're here to show us what the rover can do. But we talked a little bit about the rover. Let's talk a little bit about you guys and how the idea kind of came about. So Adam, something that you say a lot when it comes to the rover is this is the robot that you've always wanted, right? What kind of, what is the defining feature that kind of makes that statement true for you? Uh, well, you know, we've made a lot of prototypes at Sphero from the Lightning McQueen product R2-D2, we've even made, you know, a home robot version here at Sphero. And the thing that we always ended up doing was buying one of these platforms on the internet. So there's, this isn't unique, there's treaded stuff out on the internet, but we would buy that. But then you had to figure out the motors, and we'd kind of reinstall motors. And then you'd have to put a new circuit board in to, like, figure out directionality and be able to have mm. our SDK and be controlled and, oh, and beef the motors up and beef this whole system up. And by the time we ended up doing that, just to build another product or kind of get our, like I said, get the mission done. It was like really hardcore. That was a lot of engineers. We had, you know, all the best engineers involved to get just the base part going. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. There's mechanics and engineering and, and you know, actual uh, electronics in here. And so once you got all of that working and right, it was like, we actually had a couple that we would almost consider sacred. They were called the pug bots. And you'd be like, don't mess with the pug bots. Cause if you want to come up with a new idea, that was a really good starting spot. Mm. And so it was crazy that as we started coming up with newer and newer ideas, this part became something that was sort of in all of them, right? So this was universal. You always had to have some sort of base, but it was the rest of the stuff that was the cool idea, like a camera or, you know, getting on Wi-Fi or talking to people or Nerf guns. And so it was all that other stuff that was much more fun. And so that's why we came up with this was let's give you the base platform so you can go and have the fun part of, you know, making robots but of course, if you're going to make a robot and robots are your passion, it's not bad to, you know, make a base like this once. But I promise you, 
you make one of these once and you'll never want to do it again, right? You buy something <laughs> already pre-made like we do. Well, when you take out a lot of those different variables, right, things just get easier to do. And so I think the rover really does do that. And so, Ryan, speaking of passions, uh, before coming here to Sphero, you were really into music. And now you're here in the technology world. Kind of how did you get from music to, to Sphero and now uh, leading the charge on the product management oh, for Rover? Sure. So that was quite a while ago. feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I've always just been a super curious person and just follow my passions. And I think there was a time in my life where I just started getting super interested in technology and startups. And I met a, a couple that started a, that was starting a company in Boulder um, almost 10 years ago called Smart Toy. And um, I reached out to them and they were building some really cool technology, really cool interactive toys. And I started working with them, writing uh, activity scripting and JavaScript. and. Uh, as we kind of developed and grew, we eventually became part of Sphero about three years ago mm -hmm. and um, and just have been building products uh, for Sphero ever since then. And with Rover, Rover was a really cool opportunity because this was like, you know, a step, you know, beyond what we had been already doing with our other EDU based robots with Spark Plus and with Bolt. And so uh, it was just like a really great opportunity to, to kind of uh, venture into a new a new realm with this robot. And so what makes this uh, robot so special for you, right? Like it's it you venturing into a new realm, right? What is that realm looking like to you and why is it awesome? Yeah, so the thing about Rover that I, I feel like personally really proud about is I feel like um, we really represented our users and like our Sphero fans in this robot. And we really kind of started uh, the, the development process with Rover by listening. Mm -hmm. We didn't start by talking. And so we, we listened to our users. What are they doing? What are they, you know, what about, you know, the user experience is meaningful to them? Where are the pain points? And so we really took that in and then used that to really guide how we designed the robot. And, and I, I think that that really is what makes this, you know, a special bot because it's not like this unveiling of something that was like, deep in somebody's mind, we really took into account the different users and, you know, teachers and students and engineers and hackers and really built that into Rover. And then, of course, um, the thing that really is like the key component to it that I think makes it super exciting is the expansion port. So mm -hmm. uh, just by adding in that little four pin UART port, it really opens up into this like whole over other universe of development and exploration and imagination and lets people really use this as like a canvas. I think of it as like a robot canvas that you can kind of paint whatever picture you want with. So it's kind of a cool, cool spot for us to be in right now. Yeah, you, you, you're touching on something that's really cool. Again, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about working with technology and hearing creativity and, you know, artisticness and the canvas is something that I love the way that you guys are bringing this kind of product to the forefront with. It's, hey, let's spark your creativity and see what you can make. And that's self-driven kind of learning like that's just really cool. And so, Adam, my next question to you is, uh, you know, some, some people say, uh, I think you say all the time, you're always going to be a maker. Right, and yeah. so always going to be a maker. <laughs> always going to be a maker, and so can you, what is a maker? Because like something that's happening all over the country are maker spaces, and how does being a maker affect you and your life, and how does Rover kind of fit into that? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I actually grew up building other stuff too, houses and working on cars, and I think a lot of people did that, and at some point that was considered like construction or you know you're a, a gearhead or something like that, but it was always really a fascination mm. with like the newer things, what's how things are made, how just the whole fascination with technology. And nowadays, the fact that technology is so easily accessible, right? Like that Raspberry Pi that we're talking about, because Pi Day is literally more powerful, like by 10x or 20x than like the coolest computers that I started out kind of working on, right? Or hundreds of X. Yeah, access right. is much easier now. Right, right? it's just yeah. easier, it's cooler, the software works, like the mouse, like everything works. I know that sounds like obvious, like it should, and I have my iPad and everything's awesome and works, but for the longest time, it didn't work. And that was actually some of the fun parts of getting over that stuff. Mm. So anyway, to back to the maker part about that, was I always loved making stuff, and a lot of times it never worked, because you'd kind of like try to make something like this. You'd try to make a robot or a friend or a robot arm or kind of any of this stuff, and for a long time it was really challenging. And I think we actually hit sort of the other side of that mountain now, where it's really fun. Because there's places like SparkFun, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talk about SparkFun all the time where you can just buy a board that can measure the the temperature. And I know that that's pretty simple, but that's cool. Like, it's very simple to hook that up and have my rover turn different colors based on the different temperature, right? Mm -hmm. So 
just that simple thing of hooking that up gets people really excited. Like I've been, you know, we we talk, we hang out outside of this, and video games is a big part of life. And we program those things, but there's something super special about a robot. Like when you get that thing <laughs> moving around, it just it gets you kind of moving. Anyway, it's that feedback, right? It's the feedback. Yeah. It's instant gratification. It's like look at it go. Um, and it's part of the same reason as you can kind of stand back and admire your your creation. Same with building a house or a car or kind of anything. It's the same world. It's just this new world is just more technical and has so much limitless possibilities. Like. We couldn't even imagine you could do this stuff back in the day. So super cool. Always going to be a maker. And so, Brent, something that uh, Adam kind of touched on is he tried to do a lot of things that ended up failing, right? And I think sometimes with like the luster of everything you see on TV, we forget that there's a lot of you know attempts at making something great. So in in your life, what are some failures that kind of brought you to where you are today? Like kind of taught you a lesson and uh, made you a maker as well. Yeah, sure. No, that's a that's a really important point, and I think it's something that we overlook a lot. Um, I'm a parent and I know teachers out there that I've talked to, even some that are here today, um, talking about failure and how to deal with failure. And in fact, I would actually say, I think failure is probably the most important uh, part of be of success, honestly. And, you know, being at Sphero for the last three years, um, you know, this is the second product that I've released since I've been here in three years. But in that time in between those two products, there was like, you know, 10 or 11 different products that we like, you know, we're like, you know, building prototypes, we're building like test apps, you know, mm -hmm. even like with Boulder Games, <laughs> like you got these crazy like You know, some products ideas. I'm sure you're like rooting for too, yeah, right? Totally, yeah, totally, man. Stuff that, stuff that we think is like super cool or maybe I'm personally super excited about or, or you know, but a lot of times you kind of, you follow those paths to a certain area and, and it's important to be able to to fail. Mm -hmm. It's important to fail and it's important to know what to do when you fail and not feel like, um, you know, that's the end of a path. It's really just the beginning of a new path. And I think that, um, like in that cycle over the last like two years that we've been kind of iterating on, like what's the next product for Sphero and going through all sorts of wild things, you know, we learned lessons along the way, um, that helped really guide Rover to be what it is now, you know, whether it's like, you know, keeping prices low or keeping like stuff approachable and keeping mm. stuff, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different factors that go into it. And every time you fail, you learn something super valuable. In fact, I would, you know, I think failures are more, even more valuable than successes. And so far, I think that's proven with Rover and the, the response that we've seen on Kickstarter has been overwhelming. I mean, honestly, when we launched that campaign that whole day, we were, I mean, we got up at like three in the morning and we were like, yeah. we don't know what's going to happen, you know? And we, like, <laughs> push the button and it, like, goes live and people are like, oh, my gosh, this thing is awesome. So when you get to kind of share that with the world, you know, it's not like you just, you know, make something awesome in a vacuum and release it. Like, there's a lot of failures that prop up almost every success. That was awesome. I loved what you said there. Uh, Adam, actually, so same thing. Uh, Ryan did cover a lot of it, though. In your personal experience, though, what's kind of something that drives you to be successful in your position? You founded a company, you have participated in a lot of hackathons yourself, right? You've found success in this world. What do you think is one thing that you, you believe that you've brought to the table that's contributed to that? Um, I think, you know, when we say you're always going to be a maker, that drive of like knowledge mm -hmm. is actually kind of the force behind that. Like I, I consider myself everything I do in my life, I always try to find the next new crazier one, right? So you find a computer and like, what else is there? And you build a computer and then you're like, well, there's supercomputers and then there's robots. And, and, and I usually get myself into these places where technology, you look out in the world and you're like, these other people, usually kids actually these days are doing these amazing things. And you're like, how do I keep up with the world, <laughs> right? Like, how do you keep up with the world? And so oftentimes for me, it's just that drive to keep up with the rest of the world that keeps me going is like, I see, uh, you know, I do a lot of like these science fairs or judging little things. And these kids are 3D printing using Raspberry Pis talking about open socket ports and stuff. And I'm like, we're doing that right now. You know what I mean? They're you like, need a job. Yeah. yeah. I was like, well, we're, that's how we talk now. So these kids in fifth and sixth and seventh grade even are doing these advanced things. And that motivates me. I'm like, hey, how could I get involved in what they're doing? Because they'll probably be handing the jobs out soon. But B, just, you know, their world's cool. And the fact that we have the internet and we can all communicate 
Um, you can almost learn anything. You can probably get a degree in almost anything in the world by YouTube and watching other people, right? Yeah. And I know parents probably hate to hear that, but like, <laughs> that's the case. There's still a place for normal education, and I got my degrees in math and physics, but and I hold those very dear because it taught me how to break problems into smaller problems. Mm -hmm. So I think people don't realize, sometimes they're like, I went to college to do this. And maybe that is pretty important, but for a lot of people, it's more about just learning how to, A, grow up, because you're usually in a weird space in your life, but B, how to break problems into little problems and, and tackle each little one until the big problem's solved. And companies are the same, you know, your life's the same, <laughs> building a project on rover is the same. It could be, sound really complicated to make a, a rover that can, you know, follow somebody and shoot a nerf dart at them, mm -hmm. right? That's like... You have to open CV and see human beings and stuff like that. So anyway, the whole point is that you could break these huge problems, this yeah. crazy robot device into smaller problems that are pretty fun. Well, let's talk about like some of the things that you can build on this rover. So Ryan, like we're going to be seeing a lot of other, you know, how the rover interacts with colors, infrared lights and objects that it can recognize. For you, what's like your favorite uh, application that you've kind of discovered? I'm sure you have a personal a personal one that you like. Yeah, actually, it's not one that I've been able to build yet, but um, there's, there's obviously, like, a crazy awesome variety of things that people have tossed around the office, like, you know, Nerf shooters, and Hunter's smile at me back there because he loves the blowtorch idea. But, actually, the one that I think is super cool, because I've got this, this, like, pesky little cattle dog at my house, and every morning when I'm drinking coffee, like, I'm sitting there waking up, and he's like the cutest little guy, but I can't resist. He comes up and he puts like a ball on my lap. And I'm like, I'm like, I just kind of give it a little toss like in the living room. And he like goes and gets it. It's like part of the morning routine. And, uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, I know the perfect solution to this because usually I'm trying to like get some other stuff done. And I was like, you know, you put a little catcher basket on Rover with a little servo in it that flings the ball up. He would totally go bananas for that. So I, first thing I want to build with Rover is a fetch bot for my dog. Just an indoor fetch bot. That's awesome. What about you, Adam? Same thing. <laughs> oh, man. So this one's crazy, but I always wanted a robot that can plug itself in. <laughs> I know that yeah. sounds crazy. And like we said, that's like the blowtorch. Like, that's a bad idea. But <laughs> I mean, imagine just the scariness of almost like AI and the future of robots. Like it just plugging into a normal outlet in a house. Because you're like, is he tapping into the, you know, what are they doing? So I just, for some reason, want to make one to plug itself in. Well, awesome. I, I don't know what I, I think for me. I think it just yeah, kind of have want? to like attack it first, right? Get familiar with it and then just say, mow my lawn, right? <laughs> you, you know, or, or uh, maybe like uh, some type of, I hate being outside. So and anything from Boulder, Colorado, by the way, um, uh, anything that can help me stay inside more often while I can automize some type of chore, I think be, would be exactly the way that I would do it. It's funny how motivation works, right? Yeah. For me, it's by not doing something. For, for you guys, it's solving problems. I think you uh, morally are a little higher than me on that, on that world. But uh, last thing for you guys for today on this hackathon um uh, ryan and adam are going to be joining me and in interviewing some people participating and helping a little bit with the groups as well so you're going to be seeing all three of our faces uh, a lot during the day Hacking. and speaking of what we might see today we've got some really cool events going out there do you have a favorite ryan go ahead yeah so well first of all i, I want to say like we've got some awesome people that came out from all over the country to join us today we've got teachers, we got parents, we got, uh, you know, we've got engineers here. So a really cool eclectic group of people that are actually Kickstarter backers that mm -hmm. came out. So that honestly is like the highlight for me is just being able to interact with these people. Um, but Quentin and Anthony built like some insane courses out there. We've already seen like some previews with it. And I think I would say um, without having seen the contestants do yet, because who knows what will actually happen. There's actually a, a micro bit challenge with like a light on a pole and the micro bit detects luck lux values and you have to like lead the rover through a maze using this like light on a pole so I'm really interested to see how that one goes man um honestly my favorite isn't one of the challenges it's just to see the sdk in use Aww. like we just you know as as we've kind of come out of this what we call you know we used to be selling a lot of disney robots we weren't really highly publicizing our SDK, the software development kit part of it. And it's open source, right? It's open yeah. source. It's really cool for, a, like, really anybody. As soon as you get to see how it works, it sounds complicated, but it's really pretty straightforward. I'm just excited to see these, you know, people who were super excited. They backed us on Kickstarter, and now they're going to come out here and, like, send our robot a command, and it's going to work. 
it sounds simple, but when you turn a light on one of these robots, it just the rest is going to be straightforward. It's going to be super excited to see that. Well, we're going to be seeing all of those events and more throughout the day, but that's going to be it for us right now. You'll be seeing Adam and Ryan a little bit later. We're going to have Rob Reynolds from SparkFun coming up next on the interview side of things, and we'll go check in on the contestants a little later as well. There's going to be some pies, there's going to be some games, and hopefully an interview with a dog. And so uh, <laughs> stay tuned. Also, for you guys watching on the streaming services, please submit questions for us to tackle and give to the participants as well as Adam and Ryan and anyone else that we might interview today. Put them on Twitch. We've got people looking at them and we'll, we'll make sure that those get answered as well. But for now, we're going to take a quick break. We'll see y'all soon.